Festivals. The Book Drunkard Festival welcomes you on this beautiful day to this lovely space tucked into the second wedge of the 13,000 year old Oak Ridges Moraine, headwaters to more than 30 beautiful rivers in our province. As peoples have done for many thousands of years, we gather here to renew friendships and make new ones and to listen to each other's stories. This place is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron Wendat peoples. Today we hold responsibilities as partners in the Williams Treaty. We acknowledge and respect the diverse histories and cultures of the peoples of this place, both those who have lived here before us and those who share this land with us today. We strive for respectful relationships with all who have gathered here on this beautiful afternoon we seek collective healing and understanding within the bonds of friendship and reconciliation. We welcome our very special guests this afternoon, Ali and Hazy Christensen, fabulous mother-daughter Raymond. <laughs> they are, of course, wonderful friends, Blue Heron and many of you in this community. We heartily thank our partner in this event, Turnstone and Ravenstone Press, and in particular, Sharon Caseberg and Janice Paulson. We invite you to scan the QR code that you'll see around the room on the posters. That will give you access to the program for today as well as our other book events. Be sure to help yourself to refreshments that Bridge Social, our lovely neighbor, provided. And the fact, well, I won't we'll talk about that maybe yet, but <laughs> later. <laughs> uh, books are also available for sale, of course, and we pay for those up front. And then I know the lovely ladies will be happy to personalize them for you afterwards. And just remember, a signed book makes a lovely Christmas gift. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator for today. Hayden Christensen is an actor, producer, and longtime Uxbridge resident. He's flown in from filming in LA to be here today to support his mother and his sister in the launch of their novel, Please Welcome. Hi everyone, <laughs> thank you so much for coming, um, see a lot of familiar faces here, which is nice. Uh, hi, Mrs. Jared. <laughs> um, this is a, a really special event for us, uh, we're here to celebrate their book, Stealing John Hancock. Um, and it's just uh, really nice to get to be here back home in Uxbridge. Um, it's beautiful weather. Uh, today's just gorgeous. Um, so we're, we're all very thankful to be here. And, and at this bookstore, our, our favorite bookstore, um, and one of our favorite places in Uxbridge, this in the cheese shop. <laughs> um, uh, my, my old drama teacher actually used to live above here very briefly just because she loved this bookstore so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we we uh, we have a, a strong connection to this place. Um, I guess we'll we'll get to the introductions, but you guys are already here, so a little yeah. awkward. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> Hi, thank you all um, for coming. <laughs> my uh, my mom actually wrote a little bio for me to read. She, she started <laughs> as a uh, as a speech writer, so I thought I'd take advantage. Um, where are we? All right. <laughs> Allie Christensen, uh, my, my dearest mother, is <laughs> I didn't the, write that. the inspiration <laughs> for everything I do and has made me the man I am today. <laughs> Maybe I wrote some of that. Her, her divine beauty <laughs> and keen intellect never cease to amaze me. <laughs> I'm joking. But I did actually ask them to, to just make some bullet points for me for their bios, and my mom's first bullet point was was inspiration for you getting into the arts. So I'm sort of teasing, but not really. Um, but my mom actually uh, has been a lifelong writer, and uh, and and is a big inspiration to me. She uh, she started writing her first novel when she was 10 years old. Um, never finished it, of course. But, uh, but she's taken some curious turns getting back to her original dream. She, uh, after attending law school and a stint living in a log cabin in the wilderness, 
She began a career as a corporate, advertising, magazine, newspaper, and speech writer, including writing supplements for the Globe and Mail. Her many published articles span a wide array of topics, from technology to movies and health to fitness and sports. Um, from there, she transitioned to screenwriting and now to novels, the form that she originally dreamed of working in. Um, and in addition to her writing career, she really is just the most wonderful woman I know and has been the best mom to her, her four kids. And, oh, don't um, make me cry so now. <laughs> Uh, Hesa, my sister. Now how are you going to top that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I like to think that I had, I had something to do with her becoming a writer because her, her first published article was on the Eco Challenge, which was an adventure race that we did together with, with our brother Tove, who's also here, uh, about 20 years ago. Um, and from there, she went on to publish articles about trekking the Amazon, crossing the Atlantic on a boat, once in a hurricane, competing around the world in Taekwondo and other adventures. She has published stories in literary magazines in Canada and abroad. Um, she is also one of the smartest people I know and is definitely the most educated out of all of, all of my siblings. Um, <laughs> she has a master's degree in environmental geography and an MFA in, cre in creative writing from UBC where she won the Random House Hazlitt Award for creative writing. So, I'm very happy to introduce Casey Christensen and Ali Christensen. Thanks, thank Hayden. you. Yeah. yeah, thanks. And thank all of you guys for coming. I mean, obviously Hayden has flown in from LA for this, so it means a lot, you being here, so yeah. thanks. Um, we've also had people come in from New York and... Um, My 96-year-old mother. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and Indiana? Oh yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Indiana is uh, another another far one coming in, and um, then of course good friends coming up from Toronto, and the Thornhill gang is all here, <laughs> and, um, and then of course the Uxbridge and Port Perry crowd, who like we just really appreciate all of your support. Yeah, we've got Dave Barton just coming in, Mayor yeah, yeah. Uxbridge. We've got actually uh, like quite a few of the local politicians coming out today, so. It's great to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming out and for the support. And of course, we have to thank Shelley. I mean, Shelley Macbeth is just the biggest supporter and proponent of the arts in our community. And we have a very vibrant arts community, and especially literature. And I mean, we can't say more about yeah. Shelley, Blue Heron Books, and the Book Drunkard Festival, which we are so honored to be a part of. And we just thank the entire staff of, of this place. Yes. <laughs> thank you, guys. Just, just like, oh! <laughs> you already said something about our publisher, but we should mention our yes. publisher, <laughs> Turnstone Press in Winnipeg. And they have just been the, the best uh, people to relate to to get this book out. And they have um, just championed us and it all along the way. So thank you. Turnstone, Sharon, yeah. and Jameis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, bear with me. This is my first time doing this. So um, <laughs> we're going to start with, I believe, a reading from the book. Correct. Is that the idea? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then and then we'll open it up to some questions. I'll ask some questions. And then you guys can ask some questions if you want, and then afterwards we'll socialize and, and yeah. chat and stuff. Okay. We did have some accolades about the book, but you can skip those. <laughs> did I miss that part? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> just, some so, great, just some great things that have been said. <laughs> so for a reading for the book, well, it's good. It's good. We're that's good. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think I got that. So obviously, basically, <laughs> nobody here has read it because today is launch day. So. Um, before we do the reading, I was just going to tell a brief synopsis of what it's about so you can sort of have an idea of what's mm -hmm. going on. Um, but it's been an exciting couple weeks, really, because, well, actually, maybe about a month. Because first, um, I'm going to do the accolades that Hayden missed. Oh, yeah, you're it's, uh, it's, I was sorry, that had nothing no, to do No, let me do it. If I got it, let me do it. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it's page one. It's page one. Page one. Yeah, just a little. Bit. And you're supposed to read. Oh, it. I'm sorry. I got it. I got it. I got it. 
All right, while just launching today, <laughs> there, we there go. have already been a lot of exciting developments. Um, all lit up, called Stealing John Hancock, this fall's blockbuster thriller. Uh, the, the Italian language rights have been sold, and it's currently being tra translated into Italian. Um, and it's chosen by Nell. Is it just N N E L S or it's Nels. Nels. Nels? It's the it's Nels. National Equitable the National Library. Network for Equitable Library Services to translate it into Braille, which is very cool. Yeah, yeah. we're really excited about that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not not a lot of books get translated into Braille, so we're. All right. Um. Um, I, there, there's a quote I'd also like to read if I could steal a copy of someone's book. Um, yes. So this is a quote from Michelle Berry, author of the thriller Everything Turns Away. Stealing John Hancock bursts from the first page like a horse at the gate and never stops running. It's a wild ride with murderers, with murderers willing to do anything to get what they want from JP and federal agents only a step behind. You simply can't put this book down. H and A Christensen have, crafti have crafted an unforgettable story of stolen identities where you can trust no one. Complications unfold so rapidly and are put to rest so smoothly that you won't ever want, to want this book to end. I'm just hoping there will be a sequel. That's nice. <laughs> we thought so. <laughs> um, okay, so now I'll, I'll give the brief synopsis of what the book's about. But I can also, I see if you, if you don't have chairs, if anyone wants to sit down, there are three at the front and there are a couple folding ones back over there if, if people get tired of standing. Um, okay, so our protagonist is J.P. Hancock and he's actually from Port Perry. And at the start of the book, he's basically a little directionless. He doesn't quite know what he's doing with his life. And he keeps trying different things, sort of chasing the American dream, but none of them ever work out. And he thinks things aren't going well until things get a whole lot worse. So what happens is a cyber criminal um, has developed a clever way of melding mortgage and identity frauds to essentially steal houses. And this is a real thing. This actually happens, this sort of crime. And this criminal decides that better than just trying to get away with it and you know stay one step ahead of the police, it's, he's better off setting up someone else and committing the crimes under someone else's name. So he steals JP's identity and commits the crimes under his name and JP's world falls apart. So JP then has the police hot on his heels and he decides to team up with a hacker to try and clear his name. And the, um, the excerpt that we have chosen to read is when JP first meets the hacker and he has contacted the hacker on the dark net and the hacker goes by the handle, The Vindicator. So we are going to do something a little different because usually an author you know, reads, a, reads a section, but since there's two of us, we thought it would be fun for Hesa to actually do one of the character's dialogues. So she's going to be The Vindicator. Ooh. I'll read the rest. And we are not the actors in the family, so this is still a reading, not a reenactment. She's really good. A little really performance. Good. A little performance. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> JP scanned the handful of people sitting in Tango Palace, that's another place downtown, uh, for the Vindicator, thinking his burly body would be easy to spot in such a place. But the only eyes that looked up to meet his were feminine, big and framed by long, dark, giraffe-like eyelashes. Yes, definitely a giraffe. Her sandy-colored hair tied back in a ponytail emphasized the angular features of her unadorned face. Tall and sinewy, she sat erect in ripped jeans and a plain white t-shirt that revealed thin but muscular arms. JP was about to turn and continue his search for the Vindicator when the young woman motioned for him to come over. He took a quick glance to either side and pointed to himself quizzically. She nodded and indicated the chair across from her. As she, he sat, she smirked. He had come to meet a lion and instead came face to face with a giraffe. Mm -hmm. You're the vindicator, he choked out the words, glancing around to make sure he wasn't overheard by the couple sitting at the table next to theirs. And you are John Paul Hancock. I knew right off when you walked through the door. The vindicator is a mouthful, so why don't you call me Erica? And you go by JP. I read that online. I also read that you've defrauded people out of millions in the past week. Quite a week. He had a thought. If she had read about him, maybe other people in the coffee shop had too. He wished he wasn't in that room. People were looking at their phones. One had a newspaper. 
Were they reading about him, watching him, preparing to turn him in? A lump formed in his throat. He looked around the room from one person to the next. No one is watching you. I assume you've seen what's online. Your photo wasn't posted, and the story won't be in print until tomorrow. She was so casual about such monumental things, it irked him. How did you know about me? He didn't wait for a reply. Why did you text me? What's with making me jump through the dark net hoops? What do you want from me? What makes you think I want something from you? I just thought you might need some help. She leaned back in her chair. I knew you'd figure out how to reach me eventually, but I'm surprised you found me so fast. From what I could gather from your shocking lack of an internet presence, I wouldn't have, pe have you pegged for a deep tech savvy, deep web sort of guy. I have my ways, but I'm more interested in your ways. I'm hoping you have something to offer me. But if you're just looking for money to keep quiet, you might as well walk out of here right now. I don't have any. Erica laughed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do want some money, but not much. I know you have some. I checked your accounts before meeting you, but you are pretty broke. You're a charity case, really. Charity case. So far, he had learned that Erica was smug and condescending. He considered walking out, but she supposedly had something else, the ability to help him. At least that's what she claimed, and he wanted to believe her. Maybe she had the skill set to prove his innocence. He didn't have to like her. Here's how this is going to work. I'm, I'm going to get you out of this mess you're in, and you're going to give me a small fee as thanks. She stopped speaking and waited. It was his turn to say something. He opened his mouth, but no words materialized. He forced it shut again. His life was swimming around inside his head in a nonsensical mock turtle soup of chaos, and he no longer knew what to feel or think, let alone say, I didn't do what they said I did. Well, of course you didn't do it. Why on earth would you contact me if you did it? She studied him for a moment. I'll get us some drinks, and when I come back, you're going to tell me the story of how they got your ID and when this all started. What do you mean, got my ID? Who o has my ID? Obviously, your identity was stolen. And whoever did it is committing rather serious crimes in your name. And the chances are you helped him do it. I imagine they went smishing, vishing, or fishing, and you bit and gave him something and allowed him to do the rest. Smishing? Smishing is by text, vishing by phone, phishing by email. JP thought back to the many scams that had tried to snag him. The fake bank email asking him to reset his password, the call he got supposedly from Canada Revenue Agency claiming he needed to pay overdue taxes or be arrested, the text message that purported to be from a popular courier telling him to send funds to pay duty on a package that didn't exist. It seemed a new tactic surfaced every week, but he never fell for them, never. He thought he was too savvy to be tricked. Could Claudia have unknown, unknowingly leaked his info? He considered the possibility. Then something that had been niggling in the back of his mind wormed its way to the front. Oh, damn. The audition. And that's the that end. was it. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Do you have a part for us? <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, that, was, that was great. So um, I guess we should start with our, with our questions now, yeah? Yeah, I guess yeah. we could do some discussion questions. Or we could just have snacks and go around. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to I wanna ask you guys some questions. Um, um, th it's a great book and, and, you know, very, very proud of you guys and, and so impressed with your, with your writing style and, and ability to develop story, but I am curious what, what the sort of inspiration for the story was, because it, you know, it's a, unusual. it's an unusual, you know, crime of identity theft and, and house stealing. So, uh, what, what drew you guys yeah, to it? Sure. You go ahead. Um, so it was actually a real newspaper article that we read. It was on Hayes's kitchen table. And the story was about a homeowner who had the deed to his house transferred to someone else who then took out a huge mortgage against his house and he knew nothing about it. And we thought, wow, that was bizarre, incredulous. Um, could, this, could this really happen? So we started researching it and we found uh, many variations on the scam. Houses tr transferred, sold, mortgaged without homeowners even knowing it. And it just seemed like such 
a monumental thing to happen and so easy for these criminals to do that we thought, ah, oh, this would make the good beginning kernel for a plot for a novel. Yeah, and it was one of those moments where like, we, we saw the concept and we thought we just can't walk away from this. The combination of, like, I think we called it monumental, the monumental size of the theft, both physically monumental and economically, and how easily it could be pulled off just gave us a lot of material to work with that, that we wanted to use. And, and what did you guys like about um, working in, in sort of a you know, f financial crime as opposed to like a more typical crime or, or theft, like murder or something, I don't know. Oh, um, so I guess there were kind of two main advantages of working with a, a financial crime compared to like a lot of thrillers have a murder in it or something like that. Um, and one is that the impact of it is actually surprising. There's, I think, I'm hoping, we're hoping for the reader, there's a sense of being blindsided by the enormity of the impact that this can have. And like from a literary perspective, that was kind of a nice tool to have. Um, the other thing that I think really drew us to it. Like unlike a murder. Yeah. yeah, unlike a murder that probably, hopefully, doesn't really personally enter most of our lives, that it's, it's something everybody can relate to. And it could strike anyone. Anyone could be the victim. Yeah, and, because uh, probably everybody has had some concept, so, some contact with, with this sort of crime, whether it's just like a fraudulent charge on your credit card or I don't know. What or the, those calls from yeah. the Canada Revenue Agency. <laughs> yeah, just saying you, you're going to get arrested if you don't pay your overdue taxes. So it just made it more relatable. And I think that kind of gives it kind of a haunting element because it allows the reader to sort of transport themselves there and think, OK, well, this, maybe this could be me. But we actually enjoy murders, too, and the book we're writing now is about a murder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't discriminate. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about your, your, uh, your main character. Um, J.P. Hancock. So, <clears throat> uh, I think he's a very interesting uh, character. You know, he's not your your typical leading man or, or hero type. Uh, you know, he struggles with anxiety and with just finding a direction in his life. Um, and he sometimes come, comes across as being a little full of himself. Uh, but you know, we see in his relationship with his grandmother that he obviously has a big heart. So he's he's a very uh, complex character. I mean, how how would you guys describe him? Well, kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> Did good. That was yeah, good. That was good. <laughs> that was good. And um, Hesa uh, described him also in the little synopsis. But yeah, he's uh, he's pretty much of a wreck when the book starts, and a bit of a bungler, and just just uh, uh, thinking that his mundane life in Port Perry is <laughs> not very good, and um, and it just uh, he tries bigger and and more grand things because he's chasing after something which is actually um, um, somewhat uh, predicated upon the fact that he's feeling very responsible for his grandmother. But he um, he's usually unsuccessful, yeah. and but then. As Hesa said, things get a lot worse. Yeah. The only thing I'd add into that is that um, he also adds a little bit of comic levity to the story because he has a pretty good sense of humor, usually laughing at himself. And when you're dealing with sort of darker subject matters, it's nice to have some of that thrown in. I mean, at least yeah. at least we find him funny. I guess yeah. we'll see if you, can, <laughs> yeah. you guys find him funny. But Maybe we're not very funny. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what do you guys like about, about having your main character be a bit of a screw up? I mean, what is that? There's a long way up. To the, the yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. Well, got, that's true. Yeah, yeah it lots give, of good character gives room for improvement. It ma ma it ensures that you have like a good character arc to the story. Having him start there, and I think everybody likes reading stories where at least your protagonist is transformed by their journey. But uh, you know, hopefully, some of the other characters in the book are as well. Um, and you know, and it's nice to read about an, a kind of an underdog that then you know, we won't give it away, but. M maybe turns out well. <laughs> yeah. You just gave it away. I gave it away. <laughs> but also, having him there, I mean, he's a pretty ordinary guy, and I think that's relatable. Like, I, I like reading stories where, I mean, it's sure, it's fun to read stories where someone has superpowers or, like, is, like, the smartest person in the world or has all these extraordinary gifts. But it's also nice to read stories. The ordinary guy. About the yeah. ordinary guy. Yeah. And you can kind of transport yourself there a little more easily. And and why, why did you guys make him from Port Perry? Oh, well, um, we love Uxbridge and Port Perry. We've been here for 
been uh, 15. You've been 15, I've been 16. Yeah, yeah, years. Yeah. And um, so we thought it would be nice to highlight a, a community that we really cared about. And um, we also wanted our JP to be from a small town and also be accessible to large cities. So that made a lot of sense. But as we started having him be from Port Perry, it was really fun to actually highlight locations that local readers could say, hey, you know, like when you go to a movie and you see Toronto or maybe Goodwood, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that you don't usually get that out of a book. So we thought that would be nice for the local community to, to recognize these places. And, and one place in particular actually ended up being um, a figure into the plot, and that's the Nettie Chocolatier. <laughs> and it's the fudge. That's the big pile of fudge. Make sure you get some fudge before you go, because that's our little thank you to yeah. you for coming out. But yeah. some of the locations um, in the book are fictional. We just made it up where, where it sort of served the story best. But I think local readers will I, recognize a lot of places there. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I but the, the story also goes to other places. Um, it actually goes from uh, Port Perry to Toronto to New York to Barbados. So it kind of has a, a kind of an international span too. So I, I, I want to know about um, the character of Erica, the, the hacker that helps JP. She's a very yeah. unusual character. Yeah, and, and she was really cool to create. Yeah, well, can you tell yeah. me a bit about that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, she has, first of all, we created a very unusual home for her. And uh, just her characteristics, and um, she's, she's very en enigmatic. She's, um, she's, I don't know, really cool. She's yeah. brilliant. She's resourceful. PhD from she's, MIT. Yeah. So you know she's, how we said it's nice to have relatable characters? <laughs> she's <laughs> the ordinary. This is the extraordinary. Yeah. 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 She's a computer geek who um, has an extremely high skill level in hacking. And um, she's had a past on the kind of the the bad side, and uh, she has now opted for the good, which is always nice in a character. And um, she's kind she of a cross between MacGyver and you know the the spy, the Matahari. Yeah, kind of picture yeah. cross between. So them. we really enjoyed creating creating yeah. Erica, and she, um, in helping uh, JP with his identity theft catastrophe, um, she also on that journey confronts some of her own demons and and uh, comes to rips with them. And yeah, she's, she was fun. Yeah, she's a good character. Yeah. <laughs> so is there, is there anything that you guys hope the readers will take away from this book after, after finishing reading Well, it? I'd say first of all, I... Without giving anything... anything yeah, away. no, I, I think we both... First Have of fun. all, we hope it's fun. Like, we hope it's a fun ride, it's an enjoyable read, and we're both huge readers, which I think every writer is, and like, it's just nice to escape into a fictional world and the way JP's life unravels is quite a roller coaster, and it's sort of neat to, to see that happen and to see what he does with that. But then also, I think we hope that people leave with connections to their own lives. So what we tried to do is we tried to use the kind of the ultimate identity theft story to explore the theme of how we each create our own identity, what makes us who we are, how we develop our own sense of self, and... As the tagline on the, books, on the book cover says, who are you really? Yeah. yeah, and then what happens when all the things you think make, make you who you are, what happens when they're all taken away, whether that's your home, your job, right down to your name, when you lose everything. What kind of resilience do you yeah. have? Yeah, what's what, left, what who are you really? What resources can you draw upon? And so we hope that that you know, rings true to the reader. So, um, I have to say, I, I, uh, I didn't know you guys had such knowledge about <laughs> darknet and criminal syndicates and NFTs and all these sort of nefarious things. Is there something I, sh I should know about you guys? Uh, <laughs> um, secret um, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, um, it was all research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was fun to research. As you get into things like this, then you, you find areas that you would never have thought about before. You know, all the hacking areas like war driving and whatever. Um, we, we, we learned a lot and we had actually um, some we had some inside sources. Unnamed people yeah. <laughs> to, uh, who told us about a lot of the, um, 
the, the, the criminal side of yeah, things. Yeah, the dark net. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's very who, who are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely looking at someone specific. <laughs> Definitely interesting to go on the dark net. Yeah, I'm just saying she ended up on the dark net, but she didn't get that herself. Well, it was very convincing. You guys, you guys obviously enjoyed oh, all that. Oh, but of course, then there's Google. Yes, yeah. and then all, there's some great RCMP officers um, sat down with us and took many panicked phone calls from us, actually, yeah. trying as we were trying to figure out the inner workings of the RCMP and what we were writing wrong. I mean, yeah. pe people yeah. really. Spent a lot of time <laughs> helping us out with all these things. Yeah. But you preface Great. it as you're a writer writing a book, and they, they yes. believed it. Yeah. But actually, it's the you know the small town connections. So yeah. I know a couple people who work for the RCMP. So I'm like, can you yeah. introduce me to someone in this line and explain yeah. that we really are writers? Yeah. <laughs> well, and we we thanks a couple of them in the acknowledgement. Yes. We yeah. didn't th we didn't thank our darkness next. Net source. <laughs> he will forever remain anonymous. <laughs> All right. I'm. I'm. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious to hear about how you uh, go about your character development. Um, and do you take inspiration from the people you already know or the people you meet, and and their sort of their their quirks? And um, I mean, we have a lot of friends and family here today <laughs> we find ourselves in your book there are a couple in the next book actually <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no she's she's, she's no, kidding. I'm we're kidding. not I'm we're kidding. really writing no. you guys no. <laughs> but i suppose um the the characters are an amalgam of characteristics we've noted in other people that have really struck us as interesting but we have not written any of you guys like we no. none of those characters are no, and <laughs> not, not that we're admitting. We're not, <laughs> not that you're admitting. To that oh, All but, right. And then once we get into a character, then that character actually becomes a, a, a being, a, love, a person that you know that you really get to know, and so that's that's a that's the real person is is what we've created in the character. Yeah, I'd also yeah. say that. Okay. The characters also, on some level, end up being a reflection of ourselves. And I think that's probably true of any writer because maybe, maybe Erica. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> Erica's your Erica. <laughs> no, because even I, I mean, our characters are obviously very varied, and some of them are you know good people, and some struggle a little bit more with that. But even even like the ones that do truly bad things, I don't think you can write a character with any depth unless you get to know them well enough to understand what makes them tick. And I think you that involves finding a common. Uh, humanity there and so once you found that you're gonna find uh, I find that we find a bit of a reflection of ourselves yeah. in that because we have to get to the point where we understand the characters I think that's yeah. very true um, so I want to know what's what it's like working together um, I always I always you know, get the daily report of you guys working together in the morning and then I'll see my mom later on but um, I never get to sort of really uh, yeah see that so I'm curious sort of you know what, what that dynamics like and so um, how do you decide who who writes what and all that stuff yeah so actually um, not to get mushy or anything but it's a joy working with with my daughter it's just and with you. such a pleasure <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, but to get down to the nitty-gritty um, when when we write we don't even have to be in the same location although it's nice to be in the same location we use screen sharing technology and and we can really be anywhere and actually during the pandemic that was uh, really came in handy because we could just be down the road from each other but we weren't seeing each other but we were, we were still writing together yeah and um, we plan out everything uh, pretty meticulously before we start writing because there's two of us so we need a, a really comprehensive outline and we do um, index cards we work in a program that does outlining and we have the whole thing mapped out before we actually start writing and then and then we take bits and we we you know feed off each other and we'll uh, write separately write together compare you know edit combine and um, and just keep working on it until we're we're both really happy with what we have um, written yeah I, sometimes people ask if there are sections that one of us wrote and sections that the other one wrote and there aren't we we wrote right. all of it together and there's sort of, yeah. I guess, a layered approach to our writing because even if she has the first go at a paragraph, I'll take it back and then rework it and it keeps getting passed back and forth until it's what we want it to be. So 
Yeah, and it's really nice if someone, if one of us is just in a little slump, the other one can kind of, you know, pick it up. And um, so it's really nice yeah. working working. And together. it actually is a lot of fun. We, like, we spend way too much time laughing. <laughs> yeah. And um, Actually rolling on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> what, so what's what's the what's the daily writing routine like? I mean, they literally get together every single morning and write for at least a few hours. And, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm very impressed with the sort of the dedication they have, but I, I'm curious what that what that routine is like. So it's been different at different times, but right now it seems to follow my daughter's Taya's school schedule, as in I drop her off then, and then, then we, we start write. working, and then we work the school day. Yeah. Um, but we don't get summer holiday. No. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, it seems yeah. to be working like that right now. And oh, occasionally, sweet. if we're in the middle of something, we'll get in the car for school pickup together, and we'll still be working in the car side by yeah. side, one of us driving the other one with <laughs> the, the computer, computer, because we don't want the thought flow interrupted. And, and my mom here will attest to the fact that if I go and visit, what happens in the morning? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to be working for you guys. Um, I think that's all the questions I have. Should we should we open it up to uh, yeah. you guys yeah. if, if if there are any audience questions? Um, yes. How long did it take you to write the book? We'd hate to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably been about five years. Yeah, but yeah. but it was um, the pandemic had a lot to do with um, with the publication. So I guess so two and a half years of that was, was with in the, the publish publishing yeah. process. Yeah. So and it it takes the publishing process takes a while, but also we um, we were lucky in that the first publisher we submitted it to picked it up. So we were yeah. very lucky there. But it still took a really long time because when we sent it in, they asked for six months of exclusivity. But this was was it March of 2020? Yes, it was March of 2020. It was March of 2020. Yeah. So then I, nobody knew what was going on then. So then six months, they said, like, look, we're interested, but can we have eight months? And then eight months was 12 months. Can we have 12 months? And then I don't know how long it ended up being in the end. Yeah, and then um, the editing process was it took a very long time. Yeah, yeah, but we were very happy to end up with them. We actually chose the, the publisher to submit it to very carefully because you do need to leave it with them for a while. So we researched publishers quite yeah. a bit and thought about like what is really the best home for this book. And, and it was really right for us. They've just been amazing. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> any, any other questions? Yeah. Yes? In your research, did you find that you would get on track with other ideas for other books? Because it seems it was pretty extensive research that went into it. Yeah. I mean, the short answer to that question is no. no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would you agree with that? Yes, and when we started, so <laughs> when we started the novel that we're working on now, that actually has had to take a big backseat to the whole editing process for the past year. So when we found interesting things in the research, we incorporated it into this book. Yeah. Like we're like, oh, I wonder if we could take that in this direction. So we start mm -hmm. with this, you know, very detailed outline, but then we're flexible in what we do with it. So if something comes along, we're like, oh, that's a cool concept. I didn't know about that. We integrated yeah. it in. And we but made some characters more important to take it in those directions. Yes, yeah. yeah. But the next book has totally different inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Have you written a lot before together, before you went back to the novel? So we have done a lot of screenwriting work together, mostly on like rewrites and script doctoring. And on then. The scripts that I'm usually working on. <laughs> yeah. They're like my go to. <laughs> If I need help with something. <laughs> yeah, so we, ha we had been working together for a long time. Yeah. And then we'd also been writing separately for a long time as well. Like yeah. she had an entire career in corporate writing. Um, and then I've done a lot more creative writing. Mm -hmm. so. so you were able to work out sort of the kinks of how you work together before you tackled big projects like that. Yes, yeah. 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 yeah, and that probably made it a lot easier. Because we already really had a system in place. And the system was the same, whether it was a, a screenplay or a novel. Yeah, it actually translated very well from screenplay to novel to be as, you know, as organized in outline form right. that we were very familiar with. Because I, I don't know if everybody's familiar with this, but there's a huge variation in how writers will go about writing a novel. Some just free write and really have nothing planned out beforehand, and other people meticulously plan out everything. And that's one thing if you're writing with a partner, you can't just free write. You really need a pretty solid outline because you have to have a shared vision for where you're going. 
And that's the same thing we did in the screenwriting. So that transferred over well. That's great. Yes? Hi. Um, did you ever have, like, I know you said it was a joy to work together, but did you ever have like any? Uh, <laughs> 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 we all want to know. Uh, did you ever have any disagreements in, in terms of like the way the story was going or a character's choice or things like that? Did you ever have? Yes. Yeah. I was going to say no. You would say no. got to agree on these beforehand. <laughs> Can you answer first, and no, then I'll tell the truth. No, because I, I, I was saying no. <laughs> what were you going to say? Well, okay, we don't disagree that often, probably because we start with a shared vision. <laughs> Try not to get in trouble here. But we definitely have yeah, put had... Put your foot in your mouth. <laughs> no, we definitely have had creative differences. And I would say this. Oh, look. Look at this. Do you guys look no, at I was waiting for the creative dis di difference no, that you're like going to talk what, about. We, we <laughs> <laughs> you can see even when they disagree, it's not really a disagreement. I would say this. Whenever we've disagreed about the direction something should go in, I don't think either one of us backs down and acquiesces that quickly. We end up in debates. No. They're just not yeah. arguments. They're but debates. But they're not arguments. And, and then we come but up with something. <laughs> Yeah, okay. But yeah. yes. But yeah. we work it out and we, it's not really an argument. It's never turned into a brawl. And I would no. <laughs> <laughs> Hey son. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, no, we we just I think uh oh, I feel like I'm getting in trouble here. No. Whenever we have disagreed about what direction something could should go in, we debate it. And we have actually at times had to pause for a couple of days. And but I think that the, <laughs> <laughs> the end result is better than the, the, the synergy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I would act, yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Because I think the thing is, we both care about our stories and our characters so much that I don't think either one of us would want the other person to back down if we thought it was going in a direction that wasn't the best direction. Yeah. So yeah. we end up, uh, yeah. this, I'm not making this up. This is what we do. We end up. Yeah. Um, yeah, having a debate. Don't look at a, me like a that. A friendly <laughs> debate. Everything no. is good. <laughs> where, where, like, each of us say the merits of our approach. It's like, well, why would you want it that way? Yeah. And I'm like, I want it this way because of this. And I'm like, well, what do you think are the advantages of taking it that way? And then in the end, we always end up agreeing yeah. because there's a logic behind it. There's never been a point where we've disagreed and one person has had to say, well, okay, I'll just, I'll go yeah. along, but it's not what I want to yeah. do. Because yeah. we always discuss it to the point that like we come to an agreement. Yes. And look. Huh? <laughs> that all is good. We even, <laughs> we even agreed on that answer in the end. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Because of your relationship in the movie business, would this book ever become a movie? Ah. Ah, well. <laughs> We'll see. Yeah, we future. shall see. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. It could be going in that direction. <laughs> we've, we've discussed, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, Finn? Um, have this, uh, writing this book ever like, make you realize things that you didn't really know about yourself? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. You answer that. OK, <laughs> I would say that all, all creative writing does that. That's one of the things that I love about writing and I know like I see a lot of writers in the room here and I think everyone would agree that it really um, causes you to be introspective and think about because you have to think about character motivations and what ma what's making characters behave the way they are and do certain things whether they're heroes or villains or somewhere in between so yeah I think I always it makes find you think about your, yeah. your own motivations yes yeah, yeah. yeah. I always find that Good I'm question. changed by the process yeah yeah uh, I was wondering if you find that you read in the same genre that you tend to write, and if that's like helpful, like you get inspiration from that, or if it, that would actually be like, harmful to the project. We, we do tend to read in the same genre. E yeah. But we, we more watch TV shows in the same genre. <laughs> <laughs> also, I want to tell a secret about you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
we, we write a lot in the thriller genre. <laughs> And we both read. I have no idea what she's going to say. We both no. read a lot of thrillers, <laughs> but I think you should all know that she also has a thing for middle grade fi fiction, oh. which is generally read by, I don't know, 11, 12, 13 year olds. And she uh, loves it. She uh, loves it. Yes, because I have read them with my granddaughter, and it was fun to do them together. <laughs> Only she then, she's now into yeah. YA because yeah. she's older now. Yeah. And who has stayed with middle grade? <laughs> <laughs> Guilty pleasures. Yep. Well, you talked a lot about outline and some of the pandemics you kind of go from the ending and work backwards. Was it like that for you? Did you write the ending first and then kind of work backwards? Or did you write the beginning and just fill in in the middle? Um, we, we wrote the entire outline. So we had actually detailed cards that went all the way to the ending. So we knew what the ending was, but we started at the beginning yeah. to, to write. Yeah. yeah, because this one started with the concept. Like we began with concept on this one um, with, the, with the house stealing idea. Then that naturally put us into the start of the story. Um, but, but we knew where it was going. We knew where it was going. Sometimes it's hard to figure out an ending, but not for this one. It sort of just seemed to fall into place on this one. We knew the twist we wanted. Yes. But I won't say what it is. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You mentioned uh, the four locations that it took place, and these are obviously locations you've lived in. Yeah. Were they chosen because that made research easier, or like I'm just thinking in terms of writing in a pandemic and not being able to actually go places? It's all no. laziness. <laughs> no, I think it's uh, really important to write about a place that, that, you, that you do know, unless you're doing you know, a, a science fiction or something like that and you're creating a new world. So yeah, um, really knew the locations and then drew upon that. Even yeah. the parts in Toronto are basically the east end of Toronto. Yeah. Like, you know where I used to live. It's all, it's all, it's all within uh, 10 minutes of there. Uh, yeah, and you heard Tango Palace. And yeah, <laughs> which was my favorite coffee shop when I lived down there. So, um, And then New York. Yeah. Obviously, she spent a lot of time in New York. Yeah. Um, and then Barbados. I used to live in Barbados. So yeah, we've, there, we've spent a lot of time there. Yeah. Any last questions? Yeah. Were you worried about setting it in? Corporate here in Canada in terms of selling it in the American market? Um, that's a really yeah, that's good, a good question. question. Um, so we're aware that things from Canada can be perceived a little differently. And especially like in movies where they, they film in Toronto but they say it's someplace in the States, you know. But we like really want to be a part of the Canadian literary community and have a voice from where we're from. And there was also a consideration in what spelling to use. And, um, and we went with Canadian we spelling. We went with Canadian spelling, and that was like a conscious de decision because yeah. I know a lot of writers will switch over to American spelling because it can open up the market for you. But I figure, yeah. you know, yeah. Canadians can read yeah. things with American spelling and British yeah. spe spelling, and yeah. we do just fine. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and we're proud Canadians. Yes. <laughs> do you have a question too? Yeah. yeah. Interesting that you wrote a female character as a hacker. Yeah. And IT is a very masculine university and the geek world as well. So, was it natural? What inspired you to write as a female or just? Yeah. So, do you want to answer it or do you want me to? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, it, not really by conscious choice, but we have in retrospect noticed that we really like to write strong female characters are the main police officer in this is also a female. A female. Um, and we don't really know where that comes from. We just yeah. enjoy these, like, yeah. these strong yeah. female characters. And, 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 and Erica is very unusual for a female, so we really like that a lot. Yes. <laughs> you know, we've already start, stated that our main male character is, is a yeah. little bit lost. Is a, so. is a, bung, a bungler. <laughs> but none of these decisions were really intentional. Just in retrospect, looking back, we have some very strong women in the book. But. Yeah. That's great. Um, I think we're, we're sort of reaching the end then. Um, yeah. This was really fun. Yeah, yeah. so thank nice. You. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, and, and being a part of this. And um, uh, thank you, Shelly, wherever you are. You're still yes. here. Thank you for, for having us and, and being so hospitable. And 
Um, and yeah, let's have some snacks. Yeah, there's some snacks. And don't forget, we have fudge for you before you go. And um, we're here to sign yeah. books if you want your book signed. Are you doing like an official sit down yeah. signing yes, thing? Yes, yeah, we're, we're bringing a table over or something. Get your book signed. Yeah. Great Christmas gift. Yeah. <laughs>